And on that note, I think we are good to go. So welcome everyone. My name is Chris Martinez and I'm the mayor of G Adventures. That's right, you heard me correct, I'm the mayor. Uh, and that just means that I have the unique privilege of championing the purpose-driven, passionate people that make up G Adventures, or as we like to call it, G Nation. Uh, and occasionally I get to do uh, events like this and hang out with amazing folks like you for some fantastic conversations. And so on that note, I do wanna welcome everyone today we're expecting about 500 people from around the world. Um, and we're, we're, we've got people joining us today from Canada, the United Kingdom, the United States. We even have folks joining us today from Nepal, Turkey, and Ecuador. Uh, so welcome to all of you. And thank you so much for joining. We hope you and your families are safe and well at this time. And we sincerely appreciate you taking the time to join us today for the latest in our series of re-travel live virtual events addressing how we can reshape travel on the other side of the pandemic. Today, we'll be talking about some very important people, children, both those we travel with and those we meet on our travels. But before we do that, I just wanna give a couple housekeeping notes to make sure we have the best possible viewing experience. So first thing is we've collected all of your questions in advance, and we're gonna to attempt to answer as many of them as possible throughout the content of the presentation. In addition to that, we're also gonna be taking some additional questions throughout the course of today's webinar. So if you weren't able to ask a question earlier, or maybe you're inspired throughout the course of the conversation, we encourage everyone to take advantage of the question and answer function in Zoom and go ahead and ask a question. We'll do our best to answer some of those uh, towards the end of today's webinar. In addition, we recommend that everyone selects fit to screen in their Zoom options to make sure that you can capture all of our panelists and everything that's happening today. Uh, and finally, we're gonna be recording this session. So if there's anything that really stands out, if you wanna share it with a friend or if you wanna refer back to it, no worries, we'll be sharing that on our YouTube channel shortly. So without further ado, I think it's time we get into this conversation. Uh, and in order for us to do that, I'm gonna kick things off with a few introductions. <clears throat> so first I'd like to introduce our host and moderator, Bruce Poon Tip. Bruce is the author of Loop Tale uh, and an entrepreneur and philanthropist, but you might know him best as the founder of G Adventures, which was founded 30 years ago today. Uh, this, excuse me, not today, this year. Welcome, Bruce. Thank you, thank you, Chris. Uh, today, Bruce is gonna be joined by Heather Greenwood Davis, and Heather is a contributing writer and on-air storyteller for National Geographic and a freelance feature writer with Canada's Globe and Mail. She's been reporting and writing stories professionally for more than 20 years. Welcome, Heather. Thanks for having me. In addition, <laughs> we're also joined today by Maria Pieri. Maria is the editorial director of the award-winning National Geographic Traveler United Kingdom and National Geographic Traveler Food and has over 20 years experience creating travel and lifestyle content. Welcome, Maria. And finally, but last but not least, we are joined today by Sebastian Moreau. And Sebastian is the founder and executive director of Friends International and the Child Safe Movement, both internationally acclaimed global social enterprises protecting and supporting marginalized children and youth. Welcome, Sebastian. And on that note, Bruce, I'll pass it to you to get the conversation started. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. Uh, good morning and good evening and good afternoon to everybody. Thank you for attending. Um, this is a very interesting topic. And, um, you know, we talked about this about a month ago because we've had so much success with our retravels. Um, we did, and you know, usually when we talk about travel, we talk about destinations and we lately we've been talking about the pandemic and, you know, getting travel restarted. Um, but this last time we did um, animal welfare and you know, we have our animal welfare guidelines and we thought it'd be very interesting to see if we, there was interest in um, child welfare because we have also child welfare guidelines. And, we, and as we put this together, we realized you know, the issue of traveling with children is, is obviously a double, you know, it's, it's something we think about with you know, traveling with our kids, but also the safety and how we think of it as an operator is the safety of children. And you know, that's why we set out our child welfare guidelines Oh, probably about five years ago um, now when we just, you know, when it was, you know, not, not even thought of on, you know, how we can, you know, keep travel safe for children. Um, so this is an amazing panel. So thank you all for being here. And especially thank you, Sebastian, for staying up late. Uh, he's over in Asia. 
um, as we, you know, embark on this topic. And, you know, it was, it was great is the interest that was shown, like the level of people that were in, was interested in attending a, a webinar based on, um, you know, um, travel and children. So let's begin um, and, and ask just, you know, just, you know, I'll ask all, the, you know, all of our guests. So our guests are specialists in either traveling with children or the idea of, you know, um, children being safe while they, uh, on, on uh, local ch children being safe with travelers. Um, something that I, I think a lot of people, especially on our side of the industry, on the operator side, um, haven't thought about for a, a very long time. Um, so let's start with um, Sebastian. So Sebastian, let's just talk about your views on, you know, your, your, your child safe and, you know, your views are about, you know, local children and, and how to keep them um, safe and, you know, especially advice we have to operators and the industry, because we have a lot of industry people attending today. Maybe you can give me just a, a couple, you know, your thoughts immediately about, you know, um, children and travel from your point of view. Well, I, thank you, and uh, thank you for having arranged your time to fit my my own Asian time. Uh, yeah, traveling with children uh, always, as you said, has two sides, right? I travel with my own kids, and it's uh, it's amazing. And wherever we go, we meet kids around us, and the impact we have on children. So. Um, about 15 years ago, we started a child safe movement, which is a, a movement of all actors of society to, to join to protect children. And one of the main topics we looked at was uh, the travel industry, because uh, based in Asia, we have so, uh, projects in Cambodia, in Laos, in Thailand, in Indonesia, huge uh, attractors for tourists. It's a, it's a main pillar of the economy. It's uh, millions of people coming from all over the world. Uh, so it's, it's really important. It has a tremendous impact. So the way we look at it is that it has a very positive impact, obviously, on the communities uh, because it brings uh, it brings the economy, it brings money, it brings jobs. And we saw with COVID overnight, the tourism stop and industries collapsing. And for Cambodia, for example, we have three pillars of the economy. We have the garment, we have the tourism, and we have uh, uh, the farming. Uh, garment collapse, tourism collapse. It's a real catastrophe. And overnight, the restaurants, the hotels, the tour operators, everything stopped. And the impact on the on the income and 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 the, the livelihood of people is obviously tremendous, uh, but with good intentions and 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 wanting to come and and discover and in this kind of very positive attitude of tourists, also many issues appear uh, because this interaction with children is not innocent. Uh, it has a lot of of consequences, and unfortunately, more often than not negative ones. It goes from the tourists wanting to, to just be nice and, and give money to children on the streets. And then we cannot work with these children anymore because they tell us, well, you know, we just made enough money. So you're breaking the social work, helping these kids out of the streets by giving them money, all the way to going to visit orphanages and schools, which has been a fashion for a while in, the, in some tourist industries. And that is extremely disruptive. Plus, it created a totally artificial industry of fake orphanages just to cater to tourists. So there, there are some really dark sides and really difficult sides of that impact on children that need to be very much in control and in, uh, in the minds of the travel uh, industry. And, and it's why it's so great to actually be in, uh, collaborating with uh, G Adventures and Planetera because we built guidelines on, on recently uh, this very interesting big guideline on for the tourism industry in dealing with children. Uh, so yeah, it's it's a big big topic. Thank you. And and Heather, what, um, your you you you, tra you have children and you travel often uh, with your children. Um, what's your view on you know traveling with children? Yeah, well, first of all, I think it's it's so rewarding for the kids you're traveling with always. And I, I love that today you're addressing it from both sides, because I think you're right. I don't think we often do that. Most often we're talking about what are the benefits for our children when they go. And I can I can list those. There's 
lots of them. Um, when we get out there though, what I've seen happening with children to Sebastian's point is I've, I've witnessed kids who break into fights over, you know, uh, trinkets that have been handed out uh, from a bus that's passing through. You know, I've witnessed communities talking about how they are facing dental issues because people come by and drop off just, you know, bags of candy um, thinking and always thinking that they're, it's well-intentioned. They want to help. They feel maybe it's guilt um, going through some of the communities and they want to leave something behind and help in some way, but not necessarily thinking through what the repercussions of their actions will be down the road. And I think one of the ways, and listen, I've, I've made some of these mistakes myself as a traveler over the years and have been trying to sort of wean myself out of doing some of these things. But I think where I am now is I try to think about it in the same way I think about my own children. How would I feel if someone came through and started handing them money on the street? How would I feel if somebody dropped a bag of candy off that, you know, and, and sort of left them to it? Um, and I think if we think about the world's children like our own children, we'll be better. Thank you. And, and Maria, how about you? Your views, just, just to start in general, um, your views on traveling with children. It's hard. <laughs> That's what it is. First and foremost, it's difficult because as you've already heard from Sebastian and Heather, there are so many things to consider, even when you're just, when you're there, let alone before you get there. For us, I think um, the, the experience that I'd probably pick up on is very much the, the photography angle. I, I personally don't allow my children to put their photos up on social media at all, really at the moment. I sort of want them to take control of that as they grow older. And yet when we go to another country, obviously you are then looking at taking images of you know, children and perhaps not asking their, um, how shall I say, their, their permission, which is kind of an unusual angle to, to, to sort of look at it from the other side, which I, I've not really considered, but I, I wouldn't take a, a photograph of anybody without asking their permission and certainly not children, let alone actually then putting it up on something like social media. So that's just to pick up on that kind of welfare angle. That's, that's the side I think that's kind of interesting that, that, that's going to come through as we are very much exploring the world, but taking photographs everywhere and, and posting them everywhere. So that's going to be an, an unusual side. Um, in terms of traveling with children to address the direct question, yeah, it's hard. I mean, it, it's, it's hard when they're young because there's all the factors to consider of just even getting on the plane. So you tend to stay domestic or short haul. It's hard mm -hmm. when they're older because at the moment, I'm I, as we were talking earlier, my two don't actually, one really wants to travel with me, the other decided that they don't want to travel, they just want to stay at home. So managing the expectations from their side as well, it, it's difficult when you're in um, a family to, to ensure that you get the right kind of trip. And I think as we will, will continue to discuss, we'll probably talk very much about the research that's involved before you travel, because that's, I think, really important from all sides. To, to almost have like a family uh, a powwow and just discuss what it is that you're looking for a trip. That's probably the first point I would sort of raise and then maybe we'll carry on. Excellent. Uh, um, Heather, I'm gonna go back to you for this question. These are some of the questions that we've had sent in uh, beforehand. And it's about traveling um, with kids and meeting local kids. Um, any recommendations that you have on how you should, how um, your kids, I guess, or you advise your kids to inter interact differently than they would with kids at home? You know, I, I, I don't think it's that different, honestly. Um, you know, you're still interacting with the same sort of uh, respect that you would at home, you know, same sort of um, natural interaction. So I know for my kids, a lot of our travels, they're meeting kids on playgrounds or, you know, we're at restaurants when they were little and, and the kids are running around and other kids are running around and, and they're doing that. If we're in a community, they're introducing themselves. Um, and we've been in situations too, which I'm sure Maria is the same, where maybe they don't have the language um, and they've still found ways to, to interact and play. So I'll, honestly, I think kids when left to their own devices do very well at finding the similarities between them. And give you one example, which is when my kids were five and seven, we actually went to Peru and it, you know, incidentally, it was a G Adventures, it was a Planetara excursion that we were on. And they saw some kids there who didn't have shoes and were running around and kicking a soccer ball that was pretty much made out of like plastic bags. And my kids begged me to be able to take off their shoes 
and join these kids in playing the game. They were most interested in the connection with the kids and the similarities they saw, you know, they love soccer too, than anything else. You know, I think kids, kids know how to make friends. And what about you, Sebastian? Maybe you can add um, from your point of view about travel, you know, when you, when, uh, you know, when you're traveling kids and meet local kids, just re reframing the question, you know, what advice would you give parents um, it may be in, ter in terms of how they might have want to have, act differently than they do at home with when meeting other kids. Do you have any advice on that? Well, actually, actually I, I would be very much in line with Heather because it's the same with my kids. Uh, and actually, the younger, the easier it is for them to just jump in the group and 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 make friends and play with them. And, and it's, it's very natural. They, they instinctively know how to do this. It just becomes more and more complicated as they grow up. Uh, and this, I don't know, I guess uh, they get more self-aware and uh, and a lot of things come kicking in and cultures and, and realizing the differences. And there it becomes more complicated. So I guess that when they're very young, it's encouraging them to mix because hey, they're having a football game and our kids want to play. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Uh, but later it's about, I guess, discussing with them because they see things and they start analyzing and they might see the difference and start wondering, well, I have shoes, they don't have shoes, what's happening? And there are a lot of conversations to be had to be very uh, supportive and, and maybe in some countries, some kids, especially coming from the West, and if they haven't traveled a lot, can be shocked by things they see and, and will have questions. And I think it's very important to have an open discussion about this and, and, and just reassure them. Uh, and it's, it's all about acceptance. It's, it's about explaining and supporting. I don't think there are rules for the children. The rules apply to the adults. Yeah, a very good point. And uh, Maria, um, we have a lot of travel media and agents in the audience. And um, what role do, can they play in educating travelers before they come? It's, you know, when you're selling people travel and you have them at that magical moment when they're excited to travel, they don't want, they don't, you know, they don't necessarily know where they want to go. And you're, you know, and you and you want to have this conversation as well in terms of educating all travelers about better ways to protect children they meet on their travels, uh, both as tourists as as well as locals. Do you have any advice on that? Advice to the uh, travel media. Uh, well, I, I guess it's our responsibility really to to ensure that we are a selling the dream, but then also selling the reality as well to ensure that people understand that if you are going to be um, traveling with children, you're going to have your own problems with that side of stuff. But then um, when you're actually meeting local children, um, I think think being aware of the guidelines that are already in place very much like G Adventures has with child, I think your guidelines are, are excellent and a good way of kind of trying to bring those into our features is, is, is a good way and a good starting point. Um, in terms of how we then uh, tell the story, that's, that's really through the writers being able to explain how they meet people, what they do, how they would, um, their experiences, and then being able to sort of tell that story through, through the actual, um, the color of the piece. I mean, that we, we trust our writers that what they, what they are doing is correct in terms of how they're traveling and seeing local children. Um, it's not, it, it's a tough one because it's not, it's not something you would, um, it's an odd one. We wouldn't dwell on it but we would ensure that our writers and our travelers are, are writing about in the right way and saying the right mm -hmm. things. Yeah, per excellent point. And, and over to you, Heather, um, as there's, there's a lot of travel agents as well on this. Could you give any advice that you would have to, to agents in the audience that would uh, on this topic as well, in terms of advice that they could give their travelers before traveling um, as an yeah, agent? I, I yeah, for sure. I think it's um, I, it definitely is about preparation. I agree with Maria that um, I think we have a responsibility and as agents, you would have a responsibility or advisors to make sure that people are prepared for what they're, they're going to um, and maybe to some, somewhat thwart that um, well-intentioned uh, gift buying that you're doing right now, you know, and all the packages of things you're thinking of bringing down to leave in the community, offering you options, offering the client options um, for where, how they can help without doing those sorts of things, talking about 
you know, the uh, not taking the photos of, of the children while you're there. All of that can be done long before the people actually arrive in destination. And in fact, I think if done correctly, you know, we talk a lot now in this age of the pandemic about travel shaming. And we've seen how effective that can be and how, for better or for worse, in how people travel. I think that can also be, you know, for lack of a nicer term, that can be a bit of a tactic for encouraging people to behave properly when they're away from home as well. Excellent. And, and Sebastian, your, your thoughts on this is also, are, it's also very important in terms of, again, to travel agents, in terms of, um, you know, their, their part in educating travelers, I think is very important. I believe, you know, a lot of these things that we do, we have, when we have, as an operator, our responsibility is educating the traveler. Um, your views on, you know, what, how we can educate the traveler and agents when they have them, you know, travelers in front of them, how they can, advice they can give on, um, you know, tra not, not only traveling with children, but obviously what we're talking about here is, is um, the role of educating them about, you know, how they, um, when their kids meet other kids locally. Well, um, at, at uh, Child Safe, we, we create seven tips for travelers. And I think those seven tips could be uh, are designed to be shared and easily uh, used by anyone so that those tips should actually be repeated regularly, posted and shown. And these include uh, the fact that children are not tourist attractions and they should not be treated as such. Uh, it's about the, the volunteering, especially the short term volunteering when you arrive in a country. Uh, there are other ways to help than doing this. There is uh, uh, the, the begging children issue. Uh, that I mentioned when we give money, what's the implication of that or, or uh, cookies and, and sweets and what's, what's the impact? Uh, the, the looking at the impact we have on their schooling also and, and what's, what's happening there. Uh, also, obviously the thing that is on many people's mind is to constantly keep an eye on sexual exploitation because travelers, unfortunately you have some that are not very good people and travel for that purpose and keeping an eye on what's happening is, is super important. Um, there's the, and just keeping your eye open on, on what's, what the risks are. And I think the travel agent's job is to give out all these tips and they repeat the ones that you have at G Adventure because we're very much aligned and repeating those and, and giving uh, more than just those tips but also maybe referral points to uh, the travelers when they arrive in a country and they see something often you see something you don't know what to do and it's it's difficult so you need to have a phone number you need to, a hotline number you need to have a name of an organization you can contact so that something can be done if you see something and travelers see a lot just because they're put in this kind of special alternative reality of the country that attracts uh, issues and and because of that they need to be able to react if they need to so advice and contacts would be for me the things that travel agent and the press should be providing travelers excellent advice and i would just put out there to agents that are attending and watching today that you know our child welfare guidelines are available uh, online if you want to grab them there and and we did we did them in in coordination with child safe um, they were excellent partners in that and so you know, a lot of the, uh, your points and, and your thoughts are incorporated in that. Um, so let's move on to just, um, you know, we're, we're in a pandemic. Uh, and, so, and, and, and there was a theme of questions from people about, you know, travel being a privilege uh, and may not be, and is not accessible to everyone. In the Western world, we have the privilege of travel. Um, and, you know, and especially not only traveling ourselves, but taking our children with us. Um, so there's, there's some question out there. How can we ensure that children develop a global view um, that traveling affords without actually leaving home? Uh, especially, you know, people are thinking this, especially now, because the last few months, you know, we've all been grounded and we can't travel. You know, so, how, Maria, I'll start with you. Um, you know, what is your view on how we can ensure that our children develop this global view without actually, if you don't have the opportunity to travel? Um, I think talking about travel is, is a start. Um, we, we, and, all, and then also, I mean, literally, I've, I've just written a, a piece just now about how we might travel for 2021 and one of them is like you know the, the first thing, first step would probably be looking at how we e-travel so we could look at 
um, introducing them to a lot of the virtual kind of uh, museum tours or exhibition tours to get them excited about it, um, talking to them about the um, joining in with their kind of homework, which sounds a bit boring, but it can be quite interesting in terms of the geog geographic side of stuff. I've been doing that with uh, with my son and that's worked quite well and getting him interested in sort of exploring the world and just pushing him pushing him to think a bit further than just looking at the at the moment they're doing the UK but what's around the UK oh isn't that interesting where's the highest mountains just just keep talking to them about it and then exploring locally as well it's sometimes the the experience of travel doesn't have to be somewhere really far away Obviously, that's kind of in some in some ways it's what's instilled in us that we all want to get away and, and see all these amazing places. But sometimes I feel like that if you travel with a purpose, if you if you're looking to go somewhere and explore, it can be on your doorstep. So for us, um, I've spent a lot of time with the children exploring the local woods or the local park and all this kind of different areas around there, discovering the uh, culture behind them, some of the history behind them, and and it can be quite fascinating. Some I think many people have found that actually exploring what's on your local doorstep they probably haven't thought about it and there are lots of places in the UK for example where I am right now in London that we just haven't explored so I think that you just got to keep talking to them about it get them excited about it for when you can and start planning and start talking about what you might want to do in the future but but those are three points I would say think local explore more keep mm -hmm. talking to them Think, think outside your box in terms of the, the things you can do. Watch TV with them, which is a bit of an odd one, but in terms of um, the um, kind of uh, nature programs that you see, ask them mm -hmm. questions about things like this. I've introduced different types of food and then talked about the food that we are eating and the cultural side of stuff. You know, okay, so let's try Mexican tonight or, you know, let's talk about this. Or remember when we went to Italy and we made the pasta, you know, that kind of thing. So you just keep Kind of thinking about different ways to sort of prod them and talk about the experiences they might um they might look to look to do very soon and the ones they've already had before and think they, and also sort of saying you're quite lucky you've done quite amazing things and there will be more things that we can do in the future so it's just keeping that hope <laughs> keep dreaming <Yeah. laughs> uh, actually you, you brought up a good point but i'll just ask you again maria just about mm. television and tv shows because there is a lot of we're all stuck at mm. home now and there's a lot of great shows that you Fantastic can watch for the children. Do, do you have any kind of recommendations that, sh uh, again, thinking thinking about the global view that you want to give your children when you can't travel, any ones that you recommend just off the top of your head? Well, for us, it's the David Attenborough um, documentary. That's the one that I was hoping you recommended. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. It was so good. David, yeah, they were so good. And, you know, I'll be uh, remiss in not recommending all the National Geographic channels <laughs> because yeah. they've had some really great stuff. Um, you know, if, if the, if you can sit down with the kids and, and get them to say, you know, spend 20, 30 minutes with me, sometimes even 15 minutes, just watching something with them that, that, and start that conversation. I think that's the most important thing. And actually, although I say, yes, nature programs, absolutely, David Attenborough, Planet Earth, superb. However, it's just as good to start watching a TV series and then saying, oh, so where do you think it's set? Oh, do you want to go and see that? So it's kind of, um, my daughter, for example, is really into um, a couple of TikTokers and she really <laughs> wants to go to LA because she thinks she's going to go meet these TikTokers. But that's okay because yeah, yeah, totally. she really wants to travel. So if, if that's what's going to make her interested, then I say, and then she'll say to me, so where are they in LA? And I'll say, well, I think they're over here. And then it's like, actually, you do realize LA is really huge. So you have to consider about where you might want it. So that brings that kind of conversation into it. And then you carry on talking about travel. I totally agree. I think there's so much travel knowledge in almost anything you watch. I mean, when when um, Lord of the Rings, when you know your kids are watching Lord oh, of the Rings, absolutely. where it was filmed, you know how it was filmed, you know the fact that you can actually go on tours with those and, and see mm -hmm. the, the the shires in New Zealand at the moment. It's it, it, there's always something that you can in terms of the global view and not even just traveling. Yeah. Heather, I'm gonna I'm gonna ask you about the same question as well, um, which is again I'll just remind you about the you know about children developing a global view um, and advice you would have even you know you know whether you can afford or not afford travel but now that we're all stuck at home um what's your advice yeah. i i agree again with with mm -hmm. everything maria said but also i'd add books you know i think there are and it doesn't have to be a travel book but uh, books that um talk about travel or include places and destinations which they all do so you know it's an opportunity especially if you're doing any sort of reading as a family to sort of talk about that and it can help kids want to travel. Also cartoons, like it doesn't, like you said, doesn't have to be 
a really heavy, hard hitting drama. You know, I remember when my kids were little and I wish I could remember the name of the cartoon, but Little Einsteins, it was. And I remember they watched this little, this cartoon and at the end of it, my son turned to me and he said, I think our next trip should be Russia. Like, and I was like, no, but, but good for you for <laughs> having a dream. Um, you know, he, it, so I think all of that can, can help inspire them. And absolutely, you know, as was said, I'm here in Toronto. We have a little everything in Toronto. There are a million neighborhoods you could um, visit and explore and walk around. You know, if, if all we can do is sort of walk a few blocks, why not walk a few blocks? in a neighborhood that's going to ex experience, um, expose you to something new, whether it's, you know, new takeout food or um, new music or whatever it might be. So I think there's a lot we can do close to home. I think you're going to see that a lot of us have, have a new appreciation for all the things that we can do that are close to home. And do you have any um, TV recommendations? Wow. Um, not off the top. Or movies? I think Jeez, on the spot, Bruce. Um, <laughs> yeah, I mean, I there's travel and there's travel and everything. There is. Um, there some, really some, is. I'm trying to think of what we've watched that I can say without embarrassing myself. Can't can't come up with anything <laughs> off the top. See, see, see with my kids. Um, so my kids are. I've I've traveled a lot with my. I have two daughters, and and um, one just went to for university, and the other one is grade twelve. So they're kind of moving away, which I'm very sad about. But they recently had this marathon because we're, I get home to go back and watch all the Disney Disney um, movies, and it's amazing how that reminded us of travel. Of course, Lion King is the obvious one of, Af of yeah. Africa, but there's so many themed like like when you look at Moana or Coco or all these movies where mm -hmm. they're themed Moana. around um, they're themed around travel, and they give you that global view if you actually take time to have a discussion before or after. But what the really meaning of the movie is and how it uh, impacts that culture because yeah. you know kids will look at it as a piece of entertainment but with just a little cu culture I mean I thought Coco was one of the most beautiful films actually that I've seen I don't know if any, any of you have seen it um, yeah. but I mean there's just stories and all of in in everything that um, our kids watch now um, I think Bruce, sorry to interrupt you but I would no. say too I think you really nailed it there it's the conversation around what you're watching right or reading that's actually going to expand it to a place where you bring it into travel, no matter what it is you're doing. It's it's that conversation. And, and as a parent, I think part of our job is to identify, um, point out those things when the kids are watching something, say, hey, that's a really cool building. You know, that's a real building. We can actually, you know, it's a place that you could actually go and see and sort of expand what they're seeing in that way. That's a good point. I'm gonna to jump to a question that I was gonna ask everyone at the end and maybe, and because I, I, you know, we all have to have conversations with our children, right? About, and, and, and a lot of people don't, they just go traveling and just say, it's a cool place. We're gonna, you know, we're going to Costa Rica, let's go. But we all should have the conversation, in, you know, beforehand and each country is different and specific on customs or religion. And we should have that conversation with our children. So I'd like to ask all of you, and I'll start with you, Sebastian, um, about that conversation that we should have before we travel with our children um, and advice about that conversation in terms of preparing our children for traveling, you know, anywhere, like just, just generally. Well, I, I, we, we travel a lot and uh, we prepare our trips and in the family, two sons, um, four of us, uh, we have created a system where we have put the name in a hat, we pull the name as, out and then we had an order and the first person decides what is the next big family trip? What's the destination? So we had, uh, uh, so it's democratic. And sometimes it's a little crazy because it's, it's interesting and maybe we cannot, but that's the rule. So every time there's the personal interest of each of us and then we discuss it and why. And then because a destination was selected, there's a lot of discussion happening beforehand about that destination. What are we expecting to see? What's going to be exciting? What are we looking for? And in our family, we're always looking at two things that are basically mapping our trip is what are the cultural interesting places to see and what is the food around it that we can then enjoy? And that's, and how do we get there? And when we plan our trip like this and, and we're really looking forward to it and that's how we plan it so that Everyone has a different style, everyone does it differently, but this preparation is, is half the trip in many ways because you're 
you're getting ready for it you're getting excited and everyone is is into it and yeah unfortunately my kids are also getting older and it's like uh, travels needing yeah but at the end of the day it's still very exciting and it's still like yeah yeah oh, that's that's going to be fun so that conversation and that interaction and and that preparation is is really really important and and you can go into what is the local cuisine what is the what are the main things and cultural things that we're going to see and enjoy and what is the culture and what's the history and and suddenly you you have so much happening it, it's it's really it's great it's it's so much fun and how about you maria on, on this on the same topic about the conversation of preparing your children before before you travel or just having a conversation about when you're preparing seems a little bit formal and, and you're on mute actually yeah sorry um, we do we prepare in that way? Um, we do. We're not we're not as good as Sebastian, I'm afraid. We don't quite have big discussions about it. It's more a case more a case of a dinner discussion, and then it will go it will go on for about two or three weeks, and eventually it will probably come down to us, which is maybe wrong, but it because they have such different kind of points of view, it's quite difficult to decide how to pick them at that next destination. Mm -hmm. But it's it's often. I'm trying to do it based on, or we try to do it based on what we think they will enjoy, even though sometimes they don't always know what they will enjoy, mm -hmm. as well as what they will learn and experience and, and try something a bit different. So we kind of do it on a, I suppose, a, I, I curate their, <laughs> I curate their answers yeah. and bring them all together. And then we, and then we uh, then decide. But in terms of um, certain destinations we, locally, you know a bit of an obvious one for us but we still really love Cornwall so we would most you know if I know that if I choose Cornwall they will be happy with that if we were then to then go further afield they also really like Kent so it's fine and then as in further afield in the UK elsewhere because Cornwall seems to be a bit of an obvious one um, but then it's really based on what what to see and what to do and I try and get them excited about the stories about what they're going to do when they get there or mm. about what they're going to see. So when we've gone to Greece, you know, really talk to them about the myths. I mean, I can't believe how well that has worked for us in terms of um, they're now actually strangely studying classics and they're really, really interested in all the Greek myths. And I think some of that's because we've always talked about it. So and I read the stories about it. And then when we went to Greece, we kind of went and saw a lot about it. And the same with we've done that with Italy as well. And I think that's kind of for us how we end up picking certain things. It's definitely food based as well. I think, you know, it helps. But um, that's more from a, mine and my partner's point of view rather than theirs. But, um, <laughs> you know, can we get them food that they will eat? But actually, everywhere we've been, absolutely fine. So I think that, that's become easier and easier as they've got older. Um, mm. Food and culture for us. Yeah. And, and I, I hate to say, if they could pick, they would just pick somewhere with a pool and um, not necessarily really, really hot, but pool and uh, somewhere where they could just go to the beach. So I always have to temper that with, you know, trying to manage that expectation. I found that that's really what they wanted when they were younger. As they get a bit older, they want a bit more. But, you know, you have to sort of think about how you're going to give them what they actually want versus what you think they want as well. Yeah, uh, that's, that's a very good point. What about, about you, Heather, on the same topic? About yeah, the conversation you, you have? Yeah, when you guys were talking, it reminded me that, um, you know, we took a big trip. We did a year-long trip in 2011 where we... Wow went around the world for a year, 29 countries, six continents, um, and they were about six and eight. And so in trying to figure out what we were gonna do and see on that trip, you can imagine, um, was quite difficult. And what we did at that time was post two really big post-it sheets on the wall. And they knew mm -hmm. that even though they didn't necessarily know places and place names, that they could go and write down things they liked to do or experiences they wanted to have. So, you know, I remember it was like, you know, I want to touch a pyramid. I want to eat ice cream for breakfast. Like they didn't have to be um, destination specific. And then as parents, we were able to sort of in planning the trip, figure out, well, okay, ice cream for breakfast can happen anywhere. But, you know, if we're going to touch a pyramid, that's a very specific thing. So, and try to incorporate some of those things um, in the trip. And then mm -hmm. when we we're on the trip, making a point of letting them know like, oh, well, this is, you know, today we get to check this one off our list of things we wanted to do. And I think that made them feel really involved in that. They're now 16 and 18. So, I mean, yeah they're not writing in crayon and post-its anymore um, but they that still that collaborative nature of creating the trip still exists so they still weigh in 
with sort of like, well, okay, I'm thinking of, I'd like to do this. Where do you think we could, you know, learn to dive or whatever that might be. And Maria, do you ever um, have a debrief after a trip? Because naturally kids want to compare destinations, right? Mm -hmm. And I want to, I want them to always, my kids to always understand the, and celebrate the differences of destinations and the differences of cultures. But they kind of sometimes, because you said like when they're young, they just want a pool or they just want, you know, uh, the beach. But do you ever have that conversation after and, and you know, debrief about, you know, because they, yeah, kids naturally want to um, com yeah. compare different trips. This was the best trip or yeah. when we went here, it was way better or yeah they do they we always compare and we also always debrief i mean maybe i'm i'm a bit mean i'm really not as good as both the sebastian and heather in that you know <laughs> they, they are as we're not quite as collaborative as perhaps we ought to be in terms of picking the destinations but that's because sometimes they don't really i think because when they were younger they they wouldn't have known what it was to pick i think and so you know we talk about all these things and then sometimes i kind of nudge them and say well would you want would you like to see this or would you like to do that but certainly um if, if I take them somewhere really awesome, which, you know, Thailand, I've taken them to Thailand or to Costa Rica, then we would compare the different um, things that they've seen, the experiences they've had, what they've learned. Um, and then what I like to do, which is maybe a bit cruel, is I then made them go, say, for example, glamping, but it wasn't, you know, with absolutely no electricity. We did that last, last year, just to, to almost prove a point that I wanted them to sort of see the difference. Mm -hmm. And then often at the time they may not quite think that they are enjoying the experience but then I would say <laughs> once you've debriefed it and had the conversation and talked about the fact that you've learned all these things and like we we learned how to make a fire we toasted marshmallows over the fire um it wasn't probably probably about a month ago we were talking about trips again and and uh, my son said that was one of the best trips wasn't it mom and it was like thank you but it's yeah. sometimes they don't realize what it is that they're learning or enjoying or, or going through as an experience and then it comes to them afterwards which is why i think it's it's good when we collaborate to to discuss what it is that we want to do and i think you're right we do, i do i'm not completely mean i do talk to them i do say yes what <laughs> is it that you like to do i'll try and incorporate that into the trip but i've always had a bit of a kind of one day you guys get to pick one day i get to pick that kind right. of thing so when we yeah. arrive in destination and then then we do it that way but in terms of debriefing absolutely we do we we talk about the different different places i mean we we have done an all-inclusive once um not my favorite and they kind of enjoyed it appreciated it but then when we did the complete opposite where we did a kind of like a bit more rugged type of trip where we've where we've kind of gone up to the atlas mountains on donkeys they, they notice the difference and, and it, sometimes it's the experience is actually it's a, so much more real when you actually can go up to the Atlas Mountains on donkeys and get rained on and you know of course it's not supposed to rain but it does you know it's kind of fun because you just cope and it's like it's a learning experience everything I think about travel is you're taken out of your comfort zone and you learn something new each time about yourself as well as the destination the people and the culture. And, and Heather I'm curious to ask you just because you mentioned that you did a round the world trip with that same question about you know, the, the, um, the conversation about and debriefing between countries and the comparison between, did you have any of those kind of conversations along the way? We did, but it was never um, sort of planned or scripted or, or yeah. like we must remember, you know, built into an itinerary, but absolutely it would just naturally occur, right? Like they would see something in one place and, and not see it in the next, you know? I remember, um, I think it was Thailand that we were going through and my youngest, who would have been about six at the time, um, it was the first time he was seeing a person who was blind without, you know, either a cane or dark glasses or something. And, and you know, he was a little, honestly, he was a little frightened when he saw somebody. And um, we explained what that was. Well, that man is just is just blind. And then when we were somewhere else and he saw somebody with the cane and 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 the dark glasses, oh, isn't it? Oh, that's a blind man too, mom. Like, so, you know, that man, maybe he couldn't afford the cane. Like what? what's happening. So we've had discussions that compare and contrast, mm -hmm. um, you know, the socioeconomic situations of countries without actually saying, you know, tomorrow we're going to discuss the socioeconomic situations yeah. in countries. Yeah, yeah. Not make it like school. Um, and I, right. I'll just add, though, because all of us have had, um, um, you know, children traveling very young. You, yours at six is, is very young. Um, the, and this is the advice to people that are watching, I think, and hopefully you can all agree that, you know, you don't have these formal conversations and you might not have the appreciation in the moment when your kids are saying, I want a pool and you're, you know, in some amazing destination. 
but when your kids get older, you start seeing the benefits that you ha that they have in terms of their global view of things, how they think of the world, maybe how they choose, you know, what they want to study, how they interact with other children at home. And we always talk about those benefits of travel. About actually, the benefits are are you know how tra travel is transformational. It's not necessarily in that necessarily always in the moment. It's when you come home. It's when you grow up. It's you know it's it's knowing it's knowing your place in the universe when you witness how other people live in the world. And it doesn't necessarily have to be like a lesson because they pick up things along the way. Um, and I just think that's just such, such important advice. But bringing it back to retravel, Sebastian, you've been you I, I coming back to you know family travel because you know we you know you mentioned and Maria mentioned as well about you know um, you know all inclusives and you know there's a real kids you know kids club culture in travel sometimes. Um, and you, you know, you're trying to get, keep your family together and with, you know, with you and, you know, having those experiences, but kids want to be with other kids and they want to, you know, have fun and activities. Um, can you see that there's a shifting though now with the retravel as we kind of, you know, come out of this pandemic. So local people, um, you know, your advice as well about, and hope, I'm hoping there's a, a shift in how people travel on the other side of this pandemic. So local people, so we people look at how local people benefit from travel and how children can benefit from tourism. You know, what are your thoughts on that, Sebastian? Um, <laughs> I, uh, a few points. Um, I'm not sure where to start. The, I'll start first with a, something I noticed uh, and going back to local travels. As travelers disappeared, uh, we just took a trip with the kids because uh, in Cambodia, as you know, there's Angkor Wat. And Angkor Wat is a, this magical place. And I visited Angkor Wat the first time in 95. It was magical. It was no one. It, it, was, it was just for me. And now suddenly there are no more tourists. So we rushed there and I had the same experience again for the first time. We were the only foreigners in that space. And it's magical. It's, it's amazing. Uh, to travel without tourists. Mm. And what's also very, 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 very interesting, and I'm bursting bubbles here, is that the local people have taken back ownership of their spaces because it's full of Cambodians who take this opportunity now to travel because there are no more foreigners, it's theirs. Uh, they, they cycle, they, they enjoy their own space. And that is beautiful. So that's very important. I think to, to keep in mind that we, we are basically taking back ownership of our own spaces and we don't necessarily need to go very far away and, and the impact it has locally is, is as important with local people than international travelers. Uh, that's one thing. And the, um, the trend, I, I think unfortunately what everyone is hoping for is back to normal, the, COVID is finished and we'll do the same as before. And that would be a big mistake. Mm. Uh, if we cannot reinvent ourselves, reinvent how we do travels and how we do just the economies and, and how all this is, is built, created, and the benefit that it has for the local communities is not thought out, integrated, really reinvented, then we missed a very precious opportunity because honestly, the mass tourism is going straight against the wall. We're destroying our own beautiful spaces. And Angkor Wat is the best example again. It was so overcrowded. You cannot see, you could not see the space anymore. Tourists gone, ownership back, Beautiful. So the, the, we need to find a better balance. We need to reinvent and not just rush into, let's go back and, and put those cruise ships out and, and create those clubs for foreigners who can then have fun for themselves. That is very dangerous. Um, and my concern will always be and always is, what is the impact on the children where we arrive? And that has to be at the center of every travel decision, uh, every travel package, every idea that comes up is how do we really support the local people uh, 
not in this artificial way of just throwing money and candies, but actually it's really going to help and do something. It, the travel has to be reinvented. I think what's really interesting is, is community-based tourism. A lot of people are interested in that, uh, but there are huge risks because the communities are not equipped to, to deal with the foreigners and protect their children. And we do a lot of training in community-based tourism just now to prepare for this next wave of tourists coming back. So what I'm trying to say is, is it should not be business as usual. It should be reinvented, rethought properly, uh, both by the industry, uh, but also by the travelers themselves and, and reassess why and how they want to travel. And then of course, the local communities need to have the ownership of their spaces. It should not be given away to the masses of foreigners because you are you're destroying what it's actually all about. Um, that, that, that is excellent, excellent points. And you know why we have this whole retravel kind of, why we develop these retravel uh, webinars and to invite people into this conversation. And for those of you who don't know, I wrote this Insta book called Unlearn, uh, the, the Year the Earth Stood Still, which is available. You can go to un unlearn.travel and you can download it for free. It's a free Insta book about how we are, there is a massive opportunity of the other side of this pandemic. And it's important that we look for opportunity because this, of, uh, from th through this pandemic and how the travel can be so much more transformational on the other side. And those points are excellent. And you know, we're just warming up and we're gonna run out of time because I see that we have tons of people asking questions um, and I'm gonna ask Chris to come back, but I just wanna ask all of you really quickly, we do have to be quick because we wanna keep this um, you know, uh, uh, concise and not to go too long, even though we, there's so many things we can talk about here. Um, it, this is just everyone's quick, um, you know, a little bit about the future in a perfect world, just say in 20 years time. Um, Marie, I'll start with you. Um, what does the future of travel look like uh, for you know, children as adults? Um, these children as adults. We'll start with you know your children and also you know local children. If you know travel can be that positive impact and that force for good. I'm not sure. If I, I'm not. I read that question when you first sent it through, and I'm not totally sure I've got the exact answer. But I I will be quick. I think it. I think travel it will be slower. It will be more considered, and it will be more sustainable, and hopefully more experience based. I think what, what we've really noticed and what we continue to notice, notice is that real drive for travel to have an experience that is quite unique or different. And it doesn't mean that experience when you get there is different. It means the person traveling has an experience that's unique to them. I think it will, slow, it will be slower. I think people won't want to travel and you know, do so many short trips and they shouldn't because they'll be more concerned about the carbon footprint and they'll be concerned about taking so many flights. I think it will involve um, more, um, hopefully, I would like to see it involve uh, slower forms of transport and slow when you get there too, so that actually you just appreciate the destination that you're in and don't try and cover the whole country in a week all the time. I'm, I'm hoping. Yeah, um, you totally understood the question. That was a perfect answer. Yeah. <laughs> Heather, what about you? <laughs> okay. Great, I get to follow perfection. Um, <laughs> Not at all. <laughs> um, I am excited for the future, though. I'm really excited. I think, you know, whether it's um, Gen Z or I'm, I'm not sure what comes after Gen Z, but um, I think they already have a global mindset. I think they have that from a really young age, the ones that travel, but also the ones that haven't traveled, but have been exposed to the ones that travel. Like, yeah. I think that also that ripple effect um, does something. These are kids that have heroes in like, you know, Greta Thunberg and, and the Malalas of the world. Um, they're already thinking about those big issues. And I think that's going to, they're going to impact where their parents take them on vacation. They're going to have something to say about that. And I think also coming out of the pandemic, you know, that interconnectedness that we're all craving. Um, I hope, I really hope that that's going to carry over to the way we travel. Excellent. And Sebastian. Um, I, I said some of it before. It's uh, in some ways, I really hope that mass tourism is, is something of the past and it has to be reinvented. Uh, and that I really think in, in a few years, the, the norm of travel would be the responsible traveling. But the big question and the challenge we have now is, is what is responsible? What does it mean and what does it entail? It will change, it will evolve, but we have 
now to build that definition of responsible traveling, uh, responsible for the people, for the environment, for the, the, the culture itself that we visit, for, for all that has to be reinvented and the, and the industry has to change entirely. If we, if we go back to before, uh, there will be no more traveling possible because there will be very little left or very little fun to be had if it's the same. So it has to be changed. And I really, again, like Heva says, I'm optimistic. Young people will change and are changing and forcing us to change. So they will reinvent that responsible travel. Let's do it now and they'll carry it on. Excellent. And I'm going to call Chris back because Chris is just going to, he's been moderating the questions in the background. Um, Chris, we've got lots I'm of questions. Back. I see. And Heather, let me tell you, now it's my turn to follow perfect because this panel has been fantastic. I've just been, if you would have seen me, I'd just be like right in front of my camera glued to it. Um, but everybody else feels the same way as well. So we have a ton of questions. Uh, and due to that, we're hoping to extend this conversation just a little bit longer. Um, but we do realize that we did market the event as a one hour session. And so if anybody does need to leave, we do wanna give you some, uh, some wrap up notes before you head off. So uh, please uh, just one more time, thank you so much for joining us today. Those of you who do have to head off. Um, just a reminder, this is the latest in our ReTravel Live uh, series where we address the most pressing topics in travel and together uh, look at how we can solve them so we can retravel the right way. Visit retravellive.com for more details on our next event. Uh, and to learn more about the great work of our guests, please visit Heather's site, globetrottingmama.com, our friends at nationalgeographic.co.uk and nationalgeographic.com, plus friendsinternational.org. Uh, and to CG Adventures selection of family trips, including our new National Geographic Family Journeys program, please visit gadventures.com where you can also access our child welfare guidelines built in partnership with Friends International and the Child Safe Movement. Uh, again, so thank you to those who have joined, but for those of you who are staying, let's go ahead and get into some questions. Uh, so the first question I have, I'm gonna flip it to Maria actually. And the question is, how can you keep children physically distanced and help them understand the concept without impacting their interactions? physically distance when they're traveling or? I would imagine with traveling, but like, let's say local travel, right? Like, how do you explain that concept to a child um, without impacting their, their social interactions and development? Mm, that's a tough one because I don't, I don't have um, very young children. I think the, the age that mine are at, at 12 and 14, they do understand. I think having, but having said that, if I put myself into parent shoes, particularly when we've gone to the park, uh, which is actually really busy, um, I think you almost need to um, create a game of it, almost came to create a story of it. I would imagine that I would still talk, talk about almost like a bubble around us and then think about how like this bubble is, is the bubble that we need to stay in so that we can experience what we need to experience. And at the moment, we're not able to go into another bubble. I think I, I, this is just literally me thinking off the top of my head because I don't have very, very young children. But I can see that in the, in the parks that we've gone to and where, we, where we've been away recently, um, it tends to be that actually that physical distance is there anyway. Um, if, if, pay, if a lot of uh, restaurants or hotels or attractions are uh, creating the right, uh, have put the correct measures in place, that distance is there anyway. So it's more a case of making it again, again, let's stand on the spot where it says two meters apart. Look, this is what two meters is, kind of taking it in that kind of way. Um, I'm not sure if I'm answering that very well, but I might throw it over yeah. to Heather. Any other ideas, Heather? <laughs> yeah, over to you, Heather. It was great, thank you, Maria. Yeah, it was. I think the only thing that jumped to mind for me is that, you know, I usually think my husband's six feet tall. And so, you know, one of the things that I've done, you know, around um, young kids is sort of said, you know, you know, could he lay down between you and, and the next person like that sort of, and I've seen at some parks, you'll see, um, like, I can't think of a specific example, but you'll see like the wingspan of a bird is used or you're this many turtles away or what, something that's relatable to the child, but I think if you can find an example that they can they can picture, that's going to be easier than telling them, you know, you've got to stay two meters apart. Amazing, thank you. 
Uh, I'm going to actually stick with you on this one, Heather. And the question is, there's, a, there's lots of debate around whether families should be taking time to travel during school time. What are your thoughts on taking children out of school for travel? And do you think it has the potential to be more educational or enriching? Yeah, as, as a mother who took her kids out of school completely for a year, yeah, I absolutely um, think it's valuable. And I think it's really important that parents have um, the right to make that decision for their children. I can tell you my kids missed grade two and four um, they came back, they went directly into grades three and five. They're now, one's in the first year of university and the other uh, is in grade 11. They haven't been hurt by, by missing that year. And what they gained in that year in terms of, are, are the skills that I value most. You know, they're empathetic and they're um, collaborative and they're global minded. Um, and those are the things that I wanted to teach them anyway. And they might've got it at school, but they definitely got it through travel. So I, I do think it's important. When they were little, we did have to make um, arrangements with the teachers and make sure that people were aware of our feelings on these things um, and you know, gave teachers a heads up if they were gonna miss school, we were responsible for doing, making sure they did the work they needed to do for those shorter breaks. Um, but I think it's, it's important, I think it's doable. And I think if you're committed to it, then you should speak with your schools about it. Amazing, thank you. I actually wanna stay with that question. I wanna flip it to Sebastian from a bit of a different perspective. In terms of raising awareness and building that awareness in children, what are your thoughts on taking children to travel, per, particularly to developing nations uh, and taking them out of school to do so? Do you find, uh, do you find power in that? I, um, I, I, I think if you can, if I could have, I would have done it. Uh, it's, it's, it's certainly a, a very, very special experience. My only concern, and maybe Heather has some ideas and from the experience is, what about the social skills of interaction with other kids? That's the issue, because when you travel a lot and move, that's probably missing. Uh, in terms of, of the, your question, to respond more clearly to a question, there is always a risk that we try to benefit ourselves from the travels so that it, I travel to make myself feel better. I travel to educate my children and it's all about us. And because it's all about us, we take, take, take and we don't really care what we leave behind. And I think that is often what's missing in the, the thinking and how, what the impact actually is. So. The, this keeping being very attuned with the, the interaction and, and the, the impact that we leave behind ourselves is essential because we tend to be very self-centered uh, and, and that can only unfortunately damage others. Uh, and that would be my reservation in that, that, uh, that kind of concept. Super interesting. And Heather, I do want to give you the opportunity just to, to touch on the, the, the social aspect of it, the social skills. Yeah. Um, no, they absolutely built their social skills. And I'll tell you that, you know, I could wax poetic on this subject forever and ever. So in the interest of time, um, I'll just say that I think what they gained or one of the things they gained in that year that speaks to that is that they gained a lot of um, self-confidence. They knew that we were going to only be in a certain spot, you know, say a playground in, in Spain or something for a, a very finite period of time. And they had those 15 minutes to, to make a friend, you know, it was that kind of thing. And what it did is it built up this confidence in themselves that carried on when they came home. So yes, they were social while they were um, away, but when they came home and friends here either, you know, decided they weren't going to be their friend anymore or whatever the situation is when you're, when you're seven, um, they were able to have the confidence and self-awareness and, you know, often would say, uh, it's okay, I've got a friend in France, you know, that sort of statement, because they were, they had built those relationships along the way. So I think you can, it's there. Wonderful. Uh, Bruce, I'm going to switch, uh, flip this next question to you. Uh, what's the earliest age you would recommend to travel with kids on a, on a family style trip? Oh, boy. I mean, I, I personally don't think there's any age, but I know that um, it depends on 
you know, what you're trying to get, you know, out of travel for your kids. I mean, I, I've seen, you know, people traveling with their children very young, like carrying them in backpacks and, and you know, and, and I know that a lot of um, parents who ask me about travel, they want to make sure the kids also remember. So that, you know, remember the trips and there's, there's that fine line of when, you know, kids are going to remember it long term. They're certainly not going to remember when you travel when they're two and three. I started with my kids my, um, when they were five. Um, five and seven were uh, when we took our first kind of big trips. Now my kids travel with me on planes and stuff to family and different things because I travel a lot. And I think my daughter was on 20 flights before she turned one, but it wasn't really, you know, it was just business trips that I used to, it was a novel of having a first child and I just carried her around like a suitcase. Um, but, um, but no, but so I think that there, I don't, I don't believe there is an age. I mean, I've seen some beautiful experiences with kids and I remember one specifically in Vietnam and I've so envious of this couple that was traveling with like children that were two and four, like very young, running around with you know kids on a beach in Vietnam. And I remember thinking, wow, what a beautiful experience for those kids. And it's and you know and the the parents weren't worried about you know are they going to remember it later? And um, they were just just the the experience of in that moment. And so I don't think there is an age. Um, it's when you're comfortable because I know that you know a lot of parents also ask about safety or if you need you know inoculations or different things and you know going into the Amazon and you need malaria or whatever it's it's tough to travel with kids so there's restrictions there but there's always somewhere you can go in the world that's safe for kids and start traveling very young I, I believe amazing uh, quick question I'm gonna pass this one to Maria and the question is how far in advance do you recommend booking international travel for families now that's assuming that vaccines are available and travel restrictions have been lifted after the pandemic. Mm, it's hard, isn't it, right now? Because um, there's, I think one of the, I'm sure you'll touch on it at some point, but you know, there, there isn't a huge amount of trust in, in some of the, uh, in some parts of the industry. So I think people will be leaving it till um, last minute, I'm afraid. Um, even with international travel, I would plan it, think about it, research it, I would probably do that for me. I would, if, if it was me, I would look around January for if I was planning it for a, a summer trip. But I would probably err on the side of caution before booking and wait, which is, I imagine, what many people would do. Because I think right now there's not a huge amount of trust in some of the industry. Not, not you know, not everyone has has behaved badly, but there are there are some areas of of the industry that have um, not refunded at times when they ought to have and I think that 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 needs to that needs to be addressed and people feel uncomfortable with receiving credit notes on on flights for example so in a normal I don't even know what normal would be now but in a normal situation I would still do it around January and I would probably book around February for a, so three to four months in advance because that gives you enough time to do if you need to have any injections or jabs and it'll give you enough time to do that it will leave you enough time to plan it and to prepare and to get excited about it. Because I think although everyone's very into or was or have been very into last minute travel, but in fact, the problem with last minute travel is you don't really appreciate the, the build up to where you're going. So I think that's a really important part of the trip to, to research it, enjoy it, get excited about it and then go ahead with it. But as I say, particularly in our country, because I can talk about the UK, I'm not sure about others, but there is definitely an issue of trust that needs to be addressed and I think the um, how should we say the operators who have behaved well will receive um, their rewards when it comes to the return to retravel as you put it but I think um, parts of the industry will struggle and that's going to have a, an impact on it. Nope you're on mute. Chris. Sorry super interesting and honestly as we've all said we could go for ages for the sake mm -hmm. of time I am gonna to have to go towards our last question, mm -hmm. uh, but this one is gonna be for everyone. And the question is now that we're starting to think about retravel, right? We've just talked about booking windows and all kinds of considerations, but let's start thinking about when we do retravel. And the question I have for everyone, is: what's your one tip for travelers to help them correctly support children when traveling? I'm gonna start with Heather on this one. Yeah, I think it would be to think about it before you go. So instead of waiting until you get there and or doing what you've always done to actually take the time before you go to a destination to think about 
um, how you can, can make a difference before you even leave home or once you come back. I think that's gonna make a difference. Amazing. Uh, Bruce, what about you? Uh, the advice for me is the, something that we've been talking about here and everyone kind of thinks, and even our, our child welfare guidance talks about this is, you know, cause kids ask a lot of questions and sometimes they actually get a little bit nervous because you're trying to over-prepare them um, uh, or, and it's all about, you know, what you would do at home. Like it shouldn't be any different what you do at home. And that's the best gift I think that you can give your kids um, that, you know, would you do that at home? Like, would you act like that at home is, is the main question why, you know, any, anybody or any you no know, adult or child would act differently uh, when they're on vacation uh, than they're at home. But if you can give that gift to children when they're young, I think it, it only stands to benefit uh, when they get older and then they, you know, and you actually have a ripple effect of going into adults and then having children. And it's, and it's really that simple. I know people think it's weird, but people think that, you know, when they travel, they can just suspend their values and their beliefs sometimes because they're in another country. And I've never understood that, but that's the best gift you can either give your kids when they're very young. They should feel absolutely natural and comfortable and you have uncomfortable moments and you say things that aren't necessarily, you know, um, appropriate in the moment. That's what kids do and be comfortable with that. But do what you do at home is, is, is my advice and, and celebrate and embrace that. And don't over prepare your kids, you know, have discussions and you know, help guide them, um, but let still let, let, let them feel comfortable. Let them, and, and they're allowed to make mistakes and they're allowed to say awkward things and have those awkward moments because all of our kids do that every day. And so there's no, <laughs> there's, there should be no difference when they're traveling. Totally, thank you, Bruce. Maria, what about you? What's your one travel tip or one tip for travelers to help them correctly support children while traveling? Take your time. I think following on from Bruce, actually, take your time and, and just go slow. Don't try to rush the experience, whatever that experience is. Don't try to rush the travel, whatever the travel is. I think just just enjoy the moment and and make sure that you're just taking it a little bit slower. I think there's always that kind of a, a wish to to rush and fit everything in and do everything and rush from here and rush from there because you feel like you have to. I think if you just take it slow and really get to know the destination, the people, the area, that's when you really get to know uh, and experience what travel is about, I think. Sometimes just getting under the skin of it. And sometimes I think we're so busy trying to get from A to B to C to D. It's just actually just standing still and saying, okay, today we'll just do not very much. We'll just mm -hmm. take it slow. We'll just mm -hmm. listen to what we feel like and just, you know, go, go off piece not think about it for a bit and just take it easy. I think that's, that's probably what I'd say. Mm -hmm. Go slow, be intentional. I love it. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Sebastian, uh, what's one tip for travelers to help them correctly support children while traveling? I will flip a little because everyone talks about their own children. I'm going to talk about the children in the countries where you arrive as a traveler. And for me, it's, it's, get the information about what you will encounter. What are the risks that you will see? What are the issues that you might face? Uh, what are the scams that you will be faced with? Uh, and what I learn how you can be constructively responsive in those settings and, and make sure that you know where to turn to uh, in case you find uh, you're facing an issue. Uh, so really looking at the tips for each country, looking at the general tips of travelers, but also country specific and having that information that allows you and your family to, to really protect children wherever you go. And to, to echo Bruce, I agree that the, one of the key principles is always the same question. Would I do this at home? Yes, no. Would I visit the school at home? No. So why would I do it in another country? Would I visit an orphanage in my own country? No, why would I do it there? Uh, don't do elsewhere what you wouldn't do at home is a very sound principle. Uh, that's a very good base, but learn the, learn the tips, learn the situations and be equipped to be responsive if needed. Amazing, educate yourself. And if you wouldn't do it here, don't do it there. 
Uh, before I pass it back to Bruce to wrap things up today, I do want to just take one more opportunity to thank everyone around the world who joined us today, as well as to thank our amazing group of panelists who have joined us for today's conversation. This is the latest of our ReTravel Live series where we're addressing the most pressing topics in travel and together looking at how we can solve them so we can ReTravel the right way. Visit ReTravelLive.com for more details on our next event. And to learn more about the great work of our guests, please visit Heather's site, globetrottingmama.com, our friends at nationalgeographic.co.uk and nationalgeographic.com, plus friends-international.org. To CG Adventure selection of family trips, including our new National Geographic Family Journeys program, please visit gadventures.com, where you can also access our child welfare guidelines built in partnership with Friends International and the Child Safe Movement. Uh, from a person who does not have children yet, I loved mm -hmm. this. I thought this was fantastic. I learned so much. So thank you so much. I'm passing it back to Bruce. Have a wonderful day. Thank you, Chris. And thank all our, I just want to thank all of you for, for attending and all of our guests for sharing. So I was a bit worried about this actually coming into it because it was such a big topic on both sides, traveling with children and then local children and putting it together in one conversation. But you guys all have made this, uh, very comfortable and made it a beautiful conversation. I think it's, there was a lot of sharing here and a, a, lot, a lot to take back. You know, we, we touched on both sides and it's, you know, as we've been talking about the, the other side of this pandemic, there's just so much talk about what is it gonna look like? You know, how, you know, what are the opportunities for us in the travel industry and the G Adventures we've been telling people that, you know, we hope there's a transformation of the industry on the other side and that the industry finally embraces its, its ability to be, to, to be transformative that we can be a transformative industry, that it can change people's lives and not just children, but adults and local people. Um, and you know, we've been saying this obviously for 30 years at G Adventures, but this pandemic has kind of brought us all together because we all need each other. After you know, three years in politics of division and walls and, you know, and you know, breaking trade agreements and populism, Brexit, whatever it is, this pandemic has kind of brought us all together because we have to come together to, to, to beat it as, 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 a, as, a, as a planet. And so our hope is that on the other side of this, um, you know, it's, it's, I don't think mainstream tourism is gonna, you know, go away, but it just needs a, a small amount of people to change how they travel or how they think of travel, be more purposeful, and it'll change the, the landscape of the industry. And that's our hope. So thank you for sharing today. It's great to, to, to be with you. And thank you for all your in, in, insight and, um, you know, personal answers. Um, and again, thanks for everyone for always attending these, these great topics of our, our, uh, the, our travelers out there and the industry as well that attends. Thanks again and, and, you know, and, and good night, Sebastian. Thank you. And thank you all for, again for, for joining us today. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Bye.